Welcome to True Health Tuesdays, and the truth will set you free. Okay, genetic and genetic expression. We're gonna break down some barriers. Now, I came up with this talk about two weeks ago, and it was driving me crazy because I had a patient who was diagnosed with stage zero cancer in a type of cancer that doesn't really, that's just been no longer recognized as cancer. And I said, okay, good, it's stage zero. It means it doesn't exist. She said, yes, but my mother had it. And I said, but it's not hereditary. There is no hereditary factor in cancer. Yes, I know that, but I still have time. And I'm going, wow. You know, I mean, the, the difference between reality and her perception of what genes and genetic expression are were incredible. I mean, there was no way to get through to this gal. So we got a couple of choices with genes, and we're gonna go over some of the myths. Like, um, are you a slave to your gene? Do you have to follow this pattern? Is your destiny preset? Or is it not your destiny? Is things and lifestyle factors, can you choose to express or suppress a gene? So what genes are? It's a study of uh, heredity. Uh, like going through life, you're gonna experience certain things. You're gonna experience pathogens, viruses, funguses, bacteria, that's gonna affect your immune system. You're gonna develop this response to those environmental pathogens and you can pass that on to your offspring. So, so let's say we have a herd of deer, reindeer, and they move away from the tundra, so they have to now adapt to different food. They do that for one or two generations and they're gonna pass on different enzymes, different immune system to their children. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the, and these genes are given by each parent to help the offspring survive. It's interesting, some genes carry a risk of certain responses to the environment that you could call disease. Like have you ever heard of sickle cell anemia? It's bad unless you live in an area with malaria, and then it can protect you. So even what we consider our diseases can be environmental adaptations to help our species. So we have to look a little bit deeper into this. Now, this is the four misunderstandings um, of genetics. For one, and I get this all the time, and, and I get it from the medical world as well as from the non-medical world. Every aspect of biology of an organism can be predicted from its genes. That's why we can do a gene test on you and we know exactly if you're going to be obese, a criminal, an alcoholic, or develop cancer. It's totally not true and we're gonna break that myth. <laughs> Single genes encode for specific anatomical or behavioral features. This is why we can find this thieving gene. That's why we can find the um, pornography gene. I mean, they're looking at certain aspects of behavior that are ridiculous. Genes are a blueprint of an organism's form and behavior. And you're gonna see this one's close, but on a blueprint, do you have to build exactly according to that blueprint? Genes are uninterrupted sections of DNA that only code for a single protein. And this blue, we're gonna blow that one away completely. So what they developed was a human genome project. Now this was started by the pharmaceutical industry because the human body has 100,000 genes or 100,000 proteins. And they thought if it was one gene for one protein, that's 100,000 genes. So if we can identify the gene that causes high blood pressure or the gene that causes high cholesterol or the gene that causes obesity, by gosh, the pharmaceutical industry has a customer here before the symptoms develop. So that's 100,000 different patentable products with 100,000 different proteins. So bam, I know what you're thinking, ka-ching. And so it was planned in 84, started in 1990, then finished in 2003. The bummer is, instead of 100,000 genes, they found about 20,000 genes, about the same as much as a mouse. Now this mouse really blew the lid off of it. Okay, and, and, and I, this is a certain type, it's called an agouti mice. Now, what they found during this human genome project, um, Randy Jertle, he's a professor at Duke University, decided to do a study to see. Now, they had bred these agouti mice. Um, they're fat, 
they die early and they're predisposed to heart disease, cancer, diabetes. And so they have all these life shortening diseases and they don't live as long as other brands of mice. And they thought they did an, you know, they would do an experiment. So what they did, uh, they took these fat sick mice and they decided to see if they could affect the expression of the gene or if the, you know, you have the gene, you're gonna develop this disease or you have this gene, you're gonna develop this. Just like all the other Goody mice. So what they did, they changed the diet of the mom mouse before she was pregnant. And <laughs> they, all they did, they gave the mom mouse, um, they're called methyl donors, and this is in exotic foods, such as onions, garlic, and beets. I know, who would ever give a mouse this stuff? Okay, but anyway, what it did, their offspring was radically different. Their offspring turned out to be healthy. They weren't predisposed to these diseases. In fact, they lived full lives. And so they coined this term epigenetics, or control above the genes. So it really doesn't matter what certain members of your family developed. Okay, they say you are what you eat, but you actually are what your great, great, great grandparents ate because this is part of the genes that you're developing, okay, and that you're with. So what we have to do is not look at the genes that you're dealt with, but look at how you express those genes. That's uh, more than a little important. So what is a gene? A gene is the blueprint. They used to think that the nucleus of the cell, because you all remember the picture of the cell. You know, you have a cell wall, you have all these organelles, mitochondria, um, Golgi uh, organs, then you have the nucleus. They used to think the nucleus was the, um, uh, the, the brains of the cell. However, you can remove a nucleus and the cell still lives. And what they found inside of that nucleus was two things, protein and DNA. And so they started to look at that DNA and they found out that it's not controlling, it's a blueprint, that's all it is. It's a blueprint for different proteins that that cell can make. Now it's the same DNA in every cell in your body, but there's different um, cells respond differently because all a cell can do is produce proteins in response to the environment. So think of this, and the, and the proteins are just a collection of amino acids. So you can produce a protein that will cause cancer. You can produce a protein that will reverse cancer. You can produce a protein that will keep your brain healthy forever or have a protein that starts to deteriorate the brain. <clears throat> the old saying is that genes load the gun, but the epigenetics, the control above the gene, pulls the trigger. So we, we have to look at this a little bit different. So, and, and you know, cancer. Obviously cancer isn't um, genetic in origin because we're seeing a massive rise in cancers. A massive rise in cancers. And the human genome hasn't changed in thousands of years. Uh, th this is a brilliant book uh, by Dr. Thomas uh, Seyfried. World-renowned researcher, genetics and biochemistry. I mean, this guy knows his stuff. And he's saying that cancer is not genetic, it's a metabolic disease. And his book is phenomenally referenced. But he's saying that you can turn on or off the expression of a disease through a number of different factors. Uh, age, viral infections, inflammation, hypoxia or low oxygen, environmental toxins, radiation, certain carcinogens or toxins in the environment. It says that, that through certain stimuli, you can express or suppress a disease. So when your neighbors or friends or relatives or medical professional says, wow, you have this gene, you can develop ankylosing spondylitis, you can develop diabetes, you can develop cancer, you can develop breast cancer. Okay, you know what I want you to do? I want you to look them straight in the eye and, and say, well, gee, doc, I can name 30 relatives that have never had those diseases and they have the same genetic makeup as I do. Because I gotta go through this same thing too with new patients. Oh yeah, my doctor says, you know, I got this, this gene and it could express itself in cancer. And I say, can you name any relatives that don't have that cancer? Okay, D does, does that make sense? Um, let's look at where the genes are, what package they're in, chromosomes. 
Now, every human being gets, has 46 chromosomes. You get 23 from mom, 23 from dad. And I know what you're thinking out. <laughs> That's why they call it 23 and me. Okay, yeah. Okay, because they're just checking. Well, now the chromosomes contain the genes. Now, some chromosomes carry thousands of important genes. Some carry a few. So it's all the basic same genes. Uh, and what, what they're carrying is DNA. And this is deoxyribonucleic acid. Now, this is, imagine it's a double helix pattern. And this is a way to contain encoded information. This is only blueprints. That's it. Now, it's in a series of sequences. And these sequences are in that double helix. Now, your environment or stimulus um, is going to control what section of this DNA that you're going to copy and produce those proteins. Okay, so I want you to own that the DNA, the deoxyribonucleic acid, that's in that double helix pattern, you're not copying the whole thing every time. Just different sections of that will express health or um, express a response to environmental toxins or pathogens, such as you know, what we call cancer or diabetes or some other pathogen. So it's really what controls that section of DNA that's copied. Does, does that make sense? Now, Genes provide the information only to what protein is going to be produced. So it's really the environment, the environment that controls it. And it's not even that, it's the perception of the environment that controls what section of that DNA is produced. So if you view the environment as safe and loving and wonderful, Okay, then your brain is going to secrete certain emotional states, which are chemicals, and your body's going to respond and produce the proteins along those lines to either increase immune system function or increase tissue production. Let's say you view the environment as dangerous, toxic, frightening. Your brain is going to secrete an emotional state, and your body's going to respond on a stress state, which means the immune system is going to be weakened, and your response is going to be that of protection in the environment. Okay, so we still have the same DNA, but based on your perception of the environment, you're going to be producing or copying different strands of that DNA. That's it. Now, telomeres. We've got that double strand and helix, okay? Now, when the DNA is copied on the ends of that DNA so it doesn't unravel, and the analogy is always used where it's the plastic end on the shoelace. Okay, this is called a telomere. Now, it's important that you understand those telomeres are, if they're long, you can copy this DNA a lot. If they're short, you can't. So, picture this. You've got, you've got a copy, okay? You make a copy of it, then take the copy and make another copy, then take that copy and make another copy. The copy gets successively less vibrant, less uh, able to read, okay? So you're making a copy of a copy of a copy. Well, the telomere length, um, they, that's how many copies you can make of the cell. And, well, short telomeres, and as opposed to long telomeres, it's the difference between biologic and chronologic age. Because remember, your body is existing now only because it can produce proteins. What proteins do you produce? Well, it's based on your environmental stimulus and your DNA, okay? Now, how many copies of those proteins can you make? Well, it depends on the telomere length. And it turns out, this is why some people can be 50, 60, 70 years old and still healthy and vibrant and fine. Other people can be 20, 30, and 40 years old and very, very sick and expressing a, a lack of ease or a disease or a dangerous stress environment. Have you seen those types of people? Yeah, we got a gal 96 years old, comes by, drives up, um, gets adjusted, and then goes on her way to stick class. She comes from yoga here, gets adjusted, and then goes to stick class. And we've got some people in their 30s and 40s that have to be driven here because they're so sick they can't extend their leg to use the gas pedal. So the difference between chronologic okay, and biologic age is the telomere length. And it's interesting, multiple studies agree on this, and I'm just going to bring up a couple. But the shorter the telomere, the less copies you can make of that DNA. 
Uh, now this one, this, this is a great journal. If you're, if you're like, like really geeky and you just want to sit around and read some cool stuff, okay, this journal has been around for 50 years. It's Science Publishing by Scientist. It's, it, it's really cool. Um, the discovery of telomeres back in the 20th century, each cell division telomere shortened, although telomere serves as a mitotic clock. This is when my, mitosis is when cells uh, split and, and duplicate. In addition, it's become apparent that the accelerated telomere erosion with a myriad of metabolic and inflammatory diseases. Wow. So wait a second. So our health is based on how we produce proteins. The proteins that were produced are not just based on the DNA, but your perception of the environment, which is, gonna, is going to expose the part of the DNA to be encoded. Okay how many copies of that DNA are dependent on the length of the telomere. And metabolic and inflammatory diseases decrease that telomere or decrease your body's ability to reproduce this. Okay, this is huge when you realize that our population is suffering from a myriad of inflammatory diseases. When, when we start going over some of these diseases, you're gonna think, oh my God, it's like our entire population is in a train heading for a concrete block wall. And, and you'll, you'll see this is, it's dangerous, but inflammatory conditions shorten your body's ability and, and to reproduce proteins which keep you alive. An association between telomere length in blood and mortality in people age 60 years old and older. The shorter the telomeres in the blood, DNA had poor survival rate. 3.18 fold higher mortality rate from heart disease and 8.54 fold higher mortality rate from infectious diseases. So wait a second. It's not the heart disease that's being expressed, okay, because of your defective genes. It's based on your environmental perception or your environmental toxicities. Just think of those rats. They were genetically predisposed to get diabetes, cancer, heart disease. They were obese, they were sick, and they weren't gonna live a full life. All the scientists did was change the nutrients of the mom so they could express different genes, healthier proteins. Now, this, this was cool. This was a case study. Now, a lot of people say, well, case studies don't matter. Uh, have you heard of the pathologist that um, had a football player who played in the NFL, died of a heart attack and he did an ops, autopsy on him. Just a movie done on him, Omalu, and, and uh, who, was, who was the guy that played? Will Smith. Will Smith, yeah, thanks. I haven't seen the movie yet, but I saw, him, I saw Dr. Omalu speak on Sunday and he was amazing. What he did, because we're talking about just one case study is gonna radically change sports world as we know it. I know who to thunk it that multiple head injuries can cause brain trauma. <laughs> News to me. Okay, but, but this, this also weakens the, the body's ability to respond to the environment. So you're talking increased cancer rates, heart disease rates, neurologic damage. So that one case study is gonna change the world. Here's a case study that's gonna change the world as well. What they did, took a 34 or 35 year old white female. They took x-rays on her. They checked her telomere length. Now this gal, uh, 35 year old elementary school teacher, presented with chronic neck pain, mid back pain for five years following a motor vehicle accident, as well as nocturnal uh, polyuria. That means she gets up at night to pee a whole bunch. Uh, the examination revealed for it, head posture, loss of curve in the neck, multiple subluxations, and the patient telomere length, interesting. So we're talking five years of pain, five years of waking up every night to urinate. So how's her sleep pattern? It's horrible. What's her stress level like? Huge. So they're gonna check her telomere length because she is in a physically, chemically, and emotionally stressed state. Does that make sense? So let's check to see how your immune system or your biologic age has opposed to your chronologic age. What they found, well, what they did in the intervention, and this is gonna sound, any, any patients that are here, it's gonna sound, well, gosh, this is what you do. Uh, the patient received corrective spinal exercises, adjustment, traction, full spine with a drop table, 
Yes, these are all drop tables. Um, uh, after 36 visits, she reported improvement in her urination at night, neck and mid-back pain and quality of life, and the post-cervical x-ray showed a correction of the cervical lordosis and follow forward head posture. So get this, loss of curve in the neck, forward head posture, damage five years post-trauma. After about 36 visits, they're showing a restoration of the curve. So this means that the brain or information of the brain had changed. A blood test showed significant improvement in patient telomere length and heart rate variability, showing improved risk to within normal limits. What was her genetic expression like after the massive physical trauma? She was going down. What was her protein, because remember, the DNA is there, it's just the blueprint. Based on your environmental stimulus of chronic pain, poor sleep patterns, uh, do you think she was taking anti-inflammatories? Possibly, it wasn't mentioned in the article. So we're talking physical, chemical, and emotional stress load. What type of proteins is she producing just to survive? Now, here's a patient, and what we're looking at here on the right-hand side is a heart rate variability test. This is what we do, okay, here to check the autonomic nervous system. Now, I'm not gonna go into the sympathetic, parasympathetic on this chart, but she is at a low functioning parasympathetic. This is the red flag light for a heart attack. And this is the side view of her neck. There's no curve in the neck at all. So she's in a similar straight to the case study I just read. And she came in with numbness in her hand, carpal tunnel syndrome. And I mean, it's like, hun, we could fix that quick, but you know, we gotta stop this. There's a heart attack waiting in your history or in the near future that we can actually fix. It's the autonomic function, the autonomic function that's everything. This is where gene and gene expression are vital. Understand that, remember, it's not the, the blueprints, it's not the DNA, that doesn't change. You're gonna pass on your DNA to your kids. It's what's expressed in that, and this is how you view your environment. You've got two automatic nervous systems Okay, they're in one part, it's called the autonomic nervous system. One part keeps you alive under stress, that's the sympathetic nervous system. It's literally located in the thoracic area in the top of the lumbar. The parasympathetic nervous system is located in the cervical spine and, or above the cervical spine and the sacrum. So if you've had a trauma to this area, this area isn't going to work right. Just had a patient today with chronic, um, well, attention deficit disorder, okay? Now how is that treated in this country today? Class two narcotics, yeah, baby, okay. They call it prescription meth, okay. <sighs> Little Ritalin, uh, number one drug traded on college campuses. In fact, you could chop that sucker up just like cocaine. <laughs> Back to the 80s, baby. Okay, no, okay, so, so when you look at this, okay, it, it's, it's, he's in a sympathetic dominant state, a fight or flight state. If you're in this fight or flight state, are you gonna be able to pay attention in school? No, you're just trying to survive. So they give you a class two narcotic that has a calming effect on you. Okay, so they call it a study aid. Honest to God, how insane is that? So remember, the DNA that you produce, the proteins that you produce are based on your perception of the environment. Do you feel it as safe or dangerous? <sighs> Americans are under physical, chemical, and emotional stress load. We are expressing abnormal um, proteins, not abnormal genes. We're expressing proteins um, efficient enough to survive in this environment. So what we really need to do is not reverse disease expression, reverse the cause of that disease expression by taking control of the genes, taking control of the proteins that are produced, and we do this through epigenetic um, methods. I, I love this, man all is callous. Okay, now, when looking at this, okay, I'm reading this article and I think, no way, I gotta, I gotta find more information. Epigenetics or gene expression, why certain genes turn off and on. Wow, you know, the doctors don't tell you this, so we can express it or suppress it. 
Now, DNA is essentially the same line of code in every single cell in a body, but not all cells perform the same jobs. Of course not. Each cell, depending on its job, is going to produce a specific type of protein to survive in the kidneys or in the lungs or in the liver or in the spleen. These are all different proteins that they have to produce. Now, this MIT professor, Menos Kellis, analyzed a total of 150 billion <laughs> genome sequencing reads. Okay, I know how much a billion is. It's a lot. Okay, so now he's taken these genes and he's saying that he tested 150 billion of the control mechanisms that could influence that gene expression. Okay, does that make sense? And I'm going, there's no way. How do you do this? If you're doing a thousand tests a day, it's going to take you a few hundred years. So I pull up how he did it. Our group at MIT aims to further our understanding of the human genome by computational integration of large-scale functional and comparative genomic databases. We use comparative genomics, genomics of multiple related species to recognize evolutionary signatures of protein-coded genes, RNA structures, microRNA, regulatory motifs, and individual regulatory elements. We use combinations of epigenetic modifications to define chromatin states associated with distinct functions, including promoter, enhancer, transcriber, and repressed regions, each with distinct functional properties. That's how he did it. Wait, am I the only nerd here? Okay, I just thought it was so cool because what he's doing, because you can't test it 150 billion times, you'd be there for forever. They're, they're looking at how the different effects. Think of this, it's, it's like if I said, I want you to test how many influences that can change a, um, a, a gene to be expressed or suppressed. How many influences? What if I showed you a picture of a puppy and you have a cat? You would think, oh my God, keep that little bastard away from me. Okay, you would, you would, you would express adrenaline, cortisol, you, your immune system would be suppressed. However, what if your cat likes dogs? You would think, oh my God, this is cool. Okay, how, how many molecules of water are in the ocean? You would think, well, gee, that's going to be kind of tough because we got evaporation, then we got rain coming in there, and then we got the, we got the, 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 the icebergs melting, but then they're also freezing. Okay, okay, we got some glaciers retreating, we got some glaciers advancing. Do you understand it'd be impossible? It's the same thing. How many, how many factors are going to be there to express or suppress a gene? Uh, I love this. Royal Society Lecture 2013, sponsored by, yes, your favorite, GlaxoSmithKline. <laughs> This drug is brought to you by baby. Okay, epigenetics, how the genome of living th things is organized and managed. I like that. Mismanaged and disorganized epigenomes lead to disease. Well said. So this means it's not the genes, it's the control above the genes. I mean, brilliant. And this is huge. This is where the money is. Epigenome manipulation may have a therapeutic value in diverse human disorders. So we're not going to suggest that lifestyle factors are that you have control of what genes are expressed or suppressed. We're going to make a drug so you can keep on going, having that crappy lifestyle. You know, we'll be able to change it. So what kind of things control the genes? What kind of things in our lifestyle do it? Well, genes that can be turned off. Drugs that are known to cause epigenetic changes. Cholesterol-lowering drugs, antidepressants, beta blockers, blood pressure drugs, diuretics, blood pressure drugs, tamoxifen, methyltrexate, anti-inflammatories, Motrin, Advil, Aleve, ibuprofen, um, anesthetics, oral contraceptives, antibiotics, permanent changes in the epigenome process, permanent changes, all of the medications all of the medications. Why? Because it's changing your environment. Your body and mind are ecosystems. This is a perfect structure. It's designed to survive giving appropriate nutrients. You start putting this stuff in there, it's going to alter your gene expression permanently. Uh, what kind of things can happen? Heart disease, cancer. Wait, no, heart disease, doesn't that come, isn't it their, their gene for that? No, what's causing it to be expressed? 
cancer, nerve and mental disorders, obesity, diabetes, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. Consequences for modern medicine are profound since it would imply our current understanding of drugging people's symptoms. Wait. Our current understanding of drugging people's symptoms. No, I'm sorry. Pharmacology is an oversimplification. What we're doing, this, this type of psychosis where your body develops symptoms in response to environmental stimuli, whether it's a cold or toxicity or deficiency. We now categorize those symptoms as a disease and give you a toxic chemical to suppress those symptoms. Yes, honest to God, this is America, okay? <laughs> Leading cause of infant deaths in the U.S. Congenital malformations, deformations, and chromosomal abnormalities. My God, we're changing the chromosomal structure on kids now. Why? Could it be that the parents are, being, uh, are expressing genes from a toxic deficient environment? Uh, disorders related to short gestation, low birth, sudden infant death syndrome. Um, what other things can trigger an epigenetic um, response? Infections. Remember? What shortens those telomere links? Inflammation. Infections is part of an inflammatory aspect. Infection, vaccines, and other environmental triggers of autoimmunity. Vaccines and several reports were found to be followed by a new onset of autoimmune diseases. See, these autoimmune diseases are not diseases. They're an expression of certain proteins based on the stimulus of these toxic, nauseous in influences. In the 60s, I was born in 1960. Really, Michael, it wasn't that long ago. Still feel pretty good. Okay, 97% of my era were born healthy. Okay, healthy. 70s, 10 years later, 94%. Why? Because perhaps toxic food, different, different environmental stimuli. 1994, 88%, 2006, 74%. That's only three out of four that are healthy. However, when we look at now, one in two kids has a chronic illness or disease, 21%, that's almost one out of four, is dis developmentally disabled. And if you look at the numbers from 2002, the CDC said one in 150 have autism. 2015, it's one in 45. Now it's one in 33. We have eight more years before it's one in two. Now, is that genetic or genetic expression? If we know that we can alter that rat's diet and affect their offspring in the positive, what kind of factors are affecting our children this way? Well, Food Integrity Now, this, this doc is brilliant. Dr. Huber, we've pretty much sacrificed an entire generation of children. The longer we go on, the more damage that is going to accumulate. Why? Because of glyphosate. This is the herbicide in Roundup. It's sprayed on all the fields. It's in our water system. It's in all the bread products if they're not organic. You are eating this. This is a mineral chelator, an herbicide, a patented antibiotic. This is affecting not just you, but your offspring. <sighs> Doctors at Sherbrooke University Hospital in Quebec um, found that corn Bt toxin in the blood of a pregnant woman and their babies as well as in the non-pregnant women in the Journal of Reproductive Toxicology. What this means, Bt toxin, it's a corn plant that was modified genetically to have their pollen be an insecticide. I'm thinking, what could possibly go wrong? Yeah. And so with the, the you know, Food and Drug Administration, they said, you know, it hasn't been proved dangerous, so <laughs> let's call it grass, generally recognized as safe, okay? So let's only feed it to the cows, not to the humans. So this Bt toxin, which is poisonous to the digestive tracts of insects, survived the cow's digestion, got embedded in the meat, survived the processing of the cow, the cooking of the cow, survived the mom's digestion, got into her bloodstream, and then into the blood of the pregnant um, mom and into the fetus. Now this is a neurotoxin, well, a toxin to the bacteria. This is gonna affect two generations now. Two generations of genetic expression. So then I look, <coughs> Now, we're not doing any studies on pregnant people, but everyone's saying that pregnant women should get vaccinated. 
So I pull up the CDC's adult vaccination schedule, and sure enough, they have pregnancy on here. Now, granted, there's no studies for this, but they say if you're pregnant, you should get the flu shot, even though it says on the flu shot that it has cancer-causing agents in there and it's not been shown to protect from the flu. Uh, of course, you need to get the Tdap shot. Of course, that may cause... Any studies that if this is going to cause gep epigenetic changes in the fetus? No, none. Okay, and of course you need the pneumococcal, the P, um, PSV23. What that means is there's 23 different viruses in that one shot. And then of course you need the meningococcal one. Uh, you can't have the MMR because that's for sure going to cause instant birth defects. Um, can't have the chickenpox one because that's also dangerous for the infant. We know that immediately and we get shingles one, that's out. But you can get the hepatitis A, the hepatitis B, and um, you know, you're good to go. So I'm looking at toxicities, and sure enough, they had a site on pregnant women. What, again, we're looking at the federal government site that says you should avoid heavy metal poisons if you're pregnant. And I'm going, wait a second, my brain's like exploding here. I'm going, okay, you're re recommending these shots that are not studied that can cause epigenetic changes that are poisonous to the mom and, and poisonous to the kid and we don't know the outcome and they're loaded with heavy metals, aluminum, the flu shot still had mercury in it. So I look at this site and it says, if you're pregnant or thinking about becoming pregnant, avoid harmful chemicals, metals and other toxic substances around the home and workplace. So I go to this first link, okay, in this upper left corner and it brings me over to toxic matters and I thought, wow, Okay, so they're recommending poisonous substances, but they're saying don't have poisonous substances if you're thinking about being pregnant. And they're talking about, my God, you know, don't eat mercury, don't eat mercury fish, don't do this stuff. But there's no mention about the mercury in the flu shots or the aluminum um, that's in the flu shots that also is neurotoxin or the MSG that's in the shots or the proteins that's in the shots. It's, it's mind boggling the amount of ignorance. Impact of environmental factors on the prevalence of autistic uh, disorders. Okay, now after 1979, this was published in 2014. Uh, autistic disorder change points years are coincident with introduction of vaccines manufactured using human fetal cell lines containing fetal and retroviral contaminants in the childhood vaccine regimes or regimens. When you, when you look at this, these human fetal cell lines are negatively affecting the kids, but it's also in a lot of the vaccines that I, that I just read that are recommended and not studied for pregnant people. Is that gonna negatively affect the kids? Yes, we see it here. We see it here. This is a genetic expression and that giant black thing, that's an x-ray over there, the big black thing in the lower left, left hand or lower right hand quadrant there, that's what a leaky gut looks like. Now, the mom had a hospital birth, so she had Pitocin, and that increases the risk of neurologic damage 60%. Epidural and a flu vaccine during the pregnancy. Of course, the kid had a hepatitis B shot at 12 hours. Uh, ear infections, yes. So he had antibiotics, even though that 93% of all ear infections are sterile. Um, of course, the mom couldn't give um, you know, milk so he was formula fed with this genetically mod soy formula, uh, mixed with fluoridated water and then microwaved. And of course he's fully vaccinated. Anybody have a problem with expressing the genes in this type of circumstance? <laughs> Honest to God, I mean, he comes in with ulcerative colitis. I'm getting 10 year olds with Crohn's disease. There's, there's no species on the planet that their digestive tract is so destroyed that they can't handle normal food. Forget about his behavior or brain. He has to get a radical shift in his environmental perception and toxic level so that he could express appropriate proteins. Can you see this? What shortens the telomere length? Inflammation, what are you looking at here? A child that's totally inflamed. It's my God, he's not gonna be here long. Nine-year-old with ulcerative colitis, same thing. And we're seeing this all the time. When, when you see a kid that is born from a normal parent. This means that they were fed normal food. You know, just like, you know what your grandparents called organic? Food. 
Okay, so they're eating what their grandparents ate. Then they're having a child at home with a midwife. So there's no silver nitrate in the eyes. There's no, there's no vitamin K shot. There's no hepatitis B shot. And the kids come out normal. It's amazing. So this is what you do for genetic expression. Okay, for genetic expression. This means you want to express the ultimate health for as long as you're alive. Uh, avoid vaccinations. Get educated. You know, educate before you vaccinate. That's going to be the easiest one. Antibiotics. Don't eat them in food. If you have a life-threatening disease, take them. But if you have bronchitis, you can't take these things. Medications. If you're taking them, we know that medications cause an epigenetic change. Find out what's wrong. Break from the system that has symptom drug. Symptom drug. The system doesn't work. It's causing alterations in our genetic expression generationally. Environmental toxins, avoid them. Non-organic, GMO foods, get rid of them. Nutritional deficiencies, fix that and get rid of the chronic stress. When we look at this proper nutrition, it seems too simple, but when I showed you that mouse, how long did it take to have that entire genome sequencing of the fat, sick, depressed, short-lived mice? How many generations did it take to fix that? One. So we can start now. We can start now. If your mother was raised on flu shots and genetically modified stuff, by God, you start now by changing your nutrition. Uh, getting healthy by, uh, probiotics in there getting, uh, eliminating processed foods, getting healthy organic foods, whole foods. Try that exotic stuff they fed the rats, okay? Beets, garlic, onions, <laughs> you know? When you look at this, the NFKB factor, nuclear factor, kappa light chain enhancer of activated B cells, that's huge, but it's a protein complex that they're now testing and finding out it's associated with a myriad of diseases, but it's a response to stress. Atherosclerosis, myocardial infarction, diabetes, allergies, asthma, Crohn's, all of these are, and I want you to read this list, but think about it. They're not diseases. They're the body producing a protein from the DNA based on environmental stimuli from stress or inflammation. Can we change that? protein production to something that suppresses these and reverses these diseases? Yes or yes? <laughs> Fermented foods, because you need to build up the, the gut flora. Omega-3s, uh, vital, because you need this for brain function. Remember, they changed that, that DNA in a rat in one generation by giving appropriate nutrients. So no matter what your lifestyle was like before, if you can change those nutrients now, do you change gene expression? Absolutely they, you do. Vitamin D levels, you've got to have it. Now it's the sunlight. If your shadow's longer than you are tall, you're not getting enough sun. Vitamin D deficiency disorders. And again, I, I, I want you to own this, the difference between genetic and genetic expression. If you're deficient in vitamin D, oh God bless you, thank you, thank you, thank you. If you're deficient in vitamin D, what kind of things happen? What type of proteins do you express? You can have digestive disorders because you're, you're expressing proteins designed for a deficient toxic environment. Skeletal disorders such as osteoporosis, we already know that, that that's going to have that effect. Okay, we talked about um, epigenetic control leading to osteoporosis, neurodevelopmental disorders, brain dysfunction, chronic infections. So if your grandma had Alzheimer's, can you change that genetic expression? Yes or yes? Absolutely. Stress in the adrenals. I just want to bring this up because realize that the stress, the stress and the inflammation are going to suppress the telomere length and alter your expression of the proteins contained within the DNA. You know, when I was building this talk, okay, I was at an x-ray um, class, and one of the chiropractors was running behind me, and he says, what are you building? Oh, you know, I'm building my next talk. It's on genetic and epigenetic control, how we can control the expression of the proteins in our body. He said, damn, who's that for? And I said, oh, patients. Who are your patients? I said, really cool people. They get it. <laughs> can you imagine, half hour ago, if I said, Look, this is the result of an environmental toxic 
um, expression of proteins that are exposed on a length of DNA based on, on your perception of the environment. I know, now you guys get it. I just think this is cool. I mean, because look at this, depression, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, all of these are a body expressing itself through based in environmental stimuli. So how do you reverse these diseases? You reverse them by, by correcting the deficiency and toxicity, changing their physical, chemical, and emotional stress load, changing their perception of the environment, changing their nutrients, and then that changes their genetic expression. You could reverse diseases by changing that. Say it with me. Wow! <laughs> it can't be that simple, but it is. How many times has someone come in here with a low functioning thyroid and I say, have you had an operation on it? And they say, no, I said, cool, we can fix that. We just got to reduce the inflammation, get the adrenal thyroid access working correctly, fix the physical, chemical, emotional stress, balance out the autonomic nervous system, get you out of that sympathetic dominant state, get you to sleep correctly. Does that make sense? It's too freaking easy. So when we talk about this, proper nerve supply, this is how your body views the environment, exercise, breathing. These five steps, you need your nervous system checked. Why? Because that's how you perceive the environment. And by God, if you perceive it dangerous, you're going to produce proteins to survive in that. They're not going to be expressing health. They're going to be expressing stress. Regular exercise, that changes it. It's called self orientation You move your joints, you're getting stimulus to the brain. It not only helps the brain function, but it helps everything. Proper nutrition, we know how important that is. That can change a, ge a genetic expression in one generation. But what are we seeing in the studies in Canada with the BT toxins? How many people are eating that burger that was, that was uh, the, the cow was fed the BT toxins? Their, their genes, their kids are gonna be negatively affected from it. So if you say organic's too expensive, grow your own. Get some non-pesticide stuff. It's just you cannot eat commercially pr pr um, produced foods. Sufficient rest and prayer and meditation. Why does prayer and meditation change your perception of the environment? It does. It does. I mean, get, check out our disease database. The drjohnbergman.com site is great um, and it's always being continually built. Um, and also, too, I can't invite you on a cruise that's going to be in six more weeks. But what we're going to do, we're going to film it. So it's going to be all the educational stuff from all the speakers and you'll be able to get it. So if you can't, go to Spain, France, or Italy. You know, this is my longest vacation since I've been working from when I started at 21 years old. I've never had more than a seven day vacation. Thank God I'm teaching. And I am bringing a bench, but the, the cruise, uh, an adjusting bench, the, the cruise company told me that it needs to be just for demonstration purposes so I could say, yes, I'm a chiropractor, that's a bench. I'm not supposed to adjust on it. Okay, any questions? Okay, study, you made her telomeres longer. Yes, that how do you make the telomeres longer? <laughs> that, that means you live her. Jonas, buddy, I, yeah, exactly, man. Okay, think of this. What kind of stuff would lengthen telomeres? Proper nutrition, change of perception of the environment. See, in that case study where her, why her telomeres were lengthened was we got her out of the stress state. This 35-year-old gal hurting for five years. She can't sleep at night for five years in massively stressed state. Her copies of the copies, that telomere length is just, it, it, she's worn down. But you change the physical, chemical, and emotional stress load, your body can make nearly an infinite number of copies. You can make copies till you're 120 years old. Some people say longer. I know, it's cool. Check, check out the book, The Blue Zones and you'll see people that consistently, areas around the world, that people consistently lived over 100 healthy. Next week, we're gonna talk about attention deficit disorder and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and you're gonna find out, guess what? Super easy to fix. Yeah, yeah, oh, it's gonna be really fun.